everyone. Hi, hi. It's 11 o'clock. It's time to worship. Um, I'm grateful that the example of our Lord, um, the example that our Lord gave us was let the children come to me because my child is not having this time change. So he's probably going to be up here with us so that he doesn't scream um, the whole day. So thank you, Jesus, for your love of children. Um, and if all of you are struggling with the time change or whatever you're struggling with, just know that this is a safe place for you to encounter the Lord as you are. Um, yeah. During this service, you can choose to stand while we sing, which is like the norm. Or if you need to sit, please sit. If you need to lay down, please lay down. Just don't let anyone trip over you. Um, and don't fall asleep. Uh, otherwise, we're really just grateful you're here. We're grateful, Lord, for the gift of community. Thank you, God, for installing your church in the world. Thank you that we get to do life together, that we are not doomed to isolation, and that we can just come and be as we are with you. We worship you, God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. We all say amen. amen. Let us stand, church. I'm leaving my past behind I'm setting my heart and mind on you Jesus I'm reaching my hands to yours Believing there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me Is good, is good Today is the day I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting what you say. Today is the day. so much more knowing that all you have in store for me is good it's good today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad in it today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad in For each of us individually we know that personally and communally you are good and you are God and you created today for our benefit we trust you God and we sing I will stand upon your truth now you I will stand upon your truth Yeah. 
with us forever. Oh, and we sing. They're just, you know, they're fun to sing. They're bouncy and high energy and catchy. But think about the words we just sang. Forever. The Lord is faithful to us, to all of creation. Forever. He is our strength. He is strong. I don't know about you, but there's a lot going on in the world. And sometimes it makes me feel really weak and really helpless and really low on hope and then I read scripture like the scripture we're going to read this morning and I I sing these words of the scripture forever you are faithful forever you are strong forever you are with us forever no matter what no matter what ugliness and darkness the world faces no matter what God you are our cornerstone you are our foundation and you do not fail you are perfect you are forever faithful thank you God is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Alone, cornerstone, weak made 
shall come with trumpet sound. May I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. For less to stand before the throne. We're just gonna sing this verse again because I want us to pay attention. I want us to pay attention to what we're singing, friends. When he shall come, when the fullness of his kingdom comes here on earth, oh God, may we be found in you, dressed in your righteousness and not our own. Because if it were ours, God, we wouldn't be found in you. So we're dressed in your righteousness, Jesus, faultless faultless because of you. Sing that again, church. When he shall come. When he shall come with trumpet sound. Please, God. Oh, may I then in him be found. We're dressed in you. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Oh, God. For less to stand before the throne. Amen. Amen. Oh, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of You are Lord, Lord of all. And all the church says, amen. Go ahead and have a seat, everyone. Kids, come on up with Miss Sandy. Hey, friends, come on over to the carpet. Hello. All right, we're going to scoot this out here. All right, hey, everybody. All right, so we've turned the calendar page and we're in a new month. We're in the month of November. Do you remember what is the most special holiday in November? What is it? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, that's right. It's a time when we get a big feast and we eat and fill our bellies and we have all our friends and our family together and we're so thankful and we give thanks, that's right. We think about all the things we're thankful for. You know, when I lived in, in Illinois, I had this design, I, this decoration on my porch and it said, Thanksgiving was never meant to be just one day. And I loved that because it, it reminds me what it says in the Bible. The Bible tells us that every day is a day for thankfulness. And I want to share with you a little bit. Right here in Psalm 118, the very first verse and the very last verse of this psalm are the same. They both say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. That's verse 1. Then you go to the last verse, verse 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. It says the same thing. So whenever the Bible repeats itself, that means, hey, listen up. That's really important. And then it's also one of our special bubble verses, what says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's say that together, okay? This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It doesn't say tomorrow or some days or once in a while. It says this is the day right now, right here. This is the day that the Lord made. And then it just doesn't say well, we might think about rejoicing. No, it says, we will rejoice and be glad in it. See, the Bible is telling us that we have a choice. We can either have a grumpy attitude, which I am not a morning person, so there are times <laughs> it happens, you know. 
Or we can have a gratitude attitude, which means we're thankful. So we have to choose each day. What are we going to do? Are we going to choose grumpiness? Or are we going to choose thankfulness? Today, we want to rejoice and be thankful. And not just one time in the day, all through the day. You know, sometimes when I'm driving and the green light comes, I'm, think, I'm like, thank you, Lord. You know, because I don't like to sit and wait at red lights. Or sometimes a parking space comes on, or if I'm getting on an on-ramp and there's a whole bunch of traffic, but all of a sudden it clears and I just go right on by and I'm like, thank you, Lord, for the break in the traffic. Or sometimes there's a cardinal and I say, thank you, Lord, for that beautiful bird. Or sometimes it's the flowers or maybe something delicious that I had to eat. There's so many things to be thankful for all day long. And I brought this along, and I'm going to give you each one of these when we're done. It's a cross, and it kind of sparkles. You see when you hold it up to the light? It kind of sparkles through there. So you can either wear it as a necklace, or what I like to do is I like to hang it by my nightstand or in my window, where I can see it all through the day as a reminder that I will rejoice and be glad in it. Even when things go wrong, there's still a reason to be thankful because even when things go wrong, God's still with you and he still loves you. So there's always a reason to give thanks and have a gratitude attitude. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, for our families, for our friends, for our clothes, for our homes, for our food, for our pets, for the sunshine, for the rain, for the seasons, for the leaves, for the flowers, for the birds. Lord, there's so much to be thankful for. Help us to choose a gratitude attitude instead of a grumpy one. We pray this in Jesus' precious name and we all shout out, Amen. Amen. Okay, you can each pick a necklace. I want a purple one. Okay. I want a purple one. You want a purple one? Here you go, honey. Here's purple. Who said pink? Did you say pink, Elena? Yes. Okay. A pink. You wanted pink? You got what pink. What would you like, Cammie? Pink. Pink. Do you want the pink one too? All right. Thanks, everybody. So Sandy pretty much summarized my sermon, and we could just do communion and go home, but the, the crushing sense of disappointment, I think, that you would exhibit. I mean, you wouldn't be able to get over it for a long time. So I'm going to preach a sermon anyway. We are reading from Psalm 118, and it's not going to be up here because I changed the reading to include more of the psalm. <clears throat> oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we do give you thanks for being a God who shares himself with us. 
coming to us in Jesus Christ, living within us through the Holy Spirit, speaking to us through your word. And may your word speak to us now and draw deeper into gratitude and love and trust. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a story about a group of senior citizens who are sitting around a table sharing their ailments. My, my arms are so weak, I can barely hold this cup of coffee, said one. My cataracts are so bad I can barely see my cup of coffee, replied another. It's gotten to the point where I can't hear anything anymore, one said in the loudest voice of anyone. I, I can't turn my head because of my arthritis in my neck, said one, to which several nodded weakly in agreement. My blood pressure pills make me dizzy, claimed another. Well, finally, one man summed it up for the whole group. I guess that's the price we pay for getting older. But thank the Lord we can all still drive. <laughs> you can always find reasons to be grateful, and we're going to think about how we grow in gratitude through the lens of Psalm 118. And I have an audacious goal this morning. If you learn and practice the habit of gratitude, you will be a happier, more joyful, more effective follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, this will change your life for the better. It has mine. Now, we see this by studying the psalm. This, part, this psalm is part of a section in the book of Psalms called the Hallel Psalms. They were used in Passover worship, and the point was to remind the Israelites of how God had delivered them from captivity. God had set his eye on the Israelites, the least of all people, says the Bible, and made them his chosen people, the apple of his eye. They used to be slaves in Egypt, but God delivered them with a mighty arm. God led them through the waters of the Red Sea and settled them in a land of milk and honey. And the psalm also refers to more recent events. And the writer is calling Israel to gratitude and praise again saying, God has delivered us once more. God is still and always a God of faithful love, and we can trust him. And so in everything, rejoice, be glad, worship, and celebrate. And scholars think that this psalm was written during a tough time in Israel's history, a time of threats from foreign military powers, a time of scarcity and deprivation. But the psalm reminds them of who they are, their God's beloved, reminds them that God has delivered them from deadly peril and says God can be trusted in the tough times now. And what is the response that the psalmist wants from the worshiping community? Gratitude. The psalm begins and ends that way like Sandy said, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And that wasn't mumbled. That was shouted by the whole assembly. God saved us. God is with us. God is for us. We are God's people. And as the Israelites were looking back and giving thanks for how God had delivered them from their enemy, so we who are followers of Jesus Christ have been delivered from enemies as well, our ancient enemies of sin and death. If you were a follower of Jesus Christ, ask yourself, where would you be? What would your life be like without Jesus? When I think about how much of a mess I was before Jesus got a hold of me, how broken I was, how I continually made terrible choices, the crushing sense of inferiority I felt, and I try to imagine what my life would have been like without Jesus, still captive to the power of evil and how it had deformed me, I know my life would have been a disaster. I look back at how God has saved me from temptation and ruin, how God has gotten me through severe depression, how God has worked through me despite my mistakes and weaknesses. And thinking of this, I'm reminded of a scene of all things from the movie Titanic, where Kate Winslet's aged character says of Leonardo DiCaprio's character Jack, he saved me in every way a person can be saved. Yeah, I have disappointments and regrets like we all do. 
but I know for sure that Jesus Christ has saved me, and I am so grateful. Some of you have been saved from evil and death, too, in the form of an addiction to pornography or substances or overspending or the endless need for approval of other people. Some of you have been saved from a life of utter brokenness. Some of you have been saved from a direction in life that would have slowly but surely led to spiritual and maybe physical destruction. Some of you have been saved out of an abusive ha past from self-hatred. If you know Jesus Christ, you know he has saved you. And the more you think about it, it'll move you to praise and gratitude. Now, the fact that the Israelites used this psalm in Passover worship and the fact that the psalm calls them to praise and gratitude tells us that gratitude needs to be a regular part of our lives, too. Now, why is that? Well, it's a really important and really effective way we awaken to the goodness of God in our daily lives. It's a really important and effective way that God drives the gospel deep into our hearts and minds. And I'm urging us to adopt the habit of gratitude like the Israelites did, to make it a regular part of our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. Like weekly, when we gather for worship. And a big reason you need worship is to drive the gospel deep down inside you, so you become this person of gratitude and thanksgiving. But it's not only a weekly discipline, it's a daily thing, a daily practice. Like Beginning the day with prayers of gratitude. This is how I start my daily prayer time, with gratitude and thanksgiving, because I need to. At the Wednesday night Bible study, I shared a joke, a very little joke, of the woman who goes to the doctor for her annual wellness checkup, and the doctor asks her, do you ever wake up grumpy? And the woman says, no, I usually let him sleep in. That is often me. But starting my day with thanking God for God's blessings and goodness, for all the good things in my life. Well, I begin the day, and so, you, so will you, from a posture of faith and trust in the goodness of God. Another way, mealtime, table grace, where before every meal you stop and thank God for the food on the plate in front of you where you eat your food slowly and mindfully, giving thanks for the taste of it, the fact that you have the abundance of it. Mindfulness through the day. When you see and experience something good, beautiful, and true, you just stop and thank God for it. You can keep a gratitude journal, a little journal on your phone or, or a little notebook you keep on a lamp table or on your bedside table where you record the blessings that you have experienced every day. You see, when you do this, when you start paying attention to your life, well, we see just how blessed and thankful we are. And this changes our self-understanding. I have a friend in South Carolina who's now a presbytery executive, and when you ask him how he is, he says, always says, I'm blessed and thankful every single time. Now, the first few times you hear him say this, you might think, well, isn't he spiritual? But you realize after you get to know him that he really means it. That's how he understands who he is fundamentally as a man who's blessed by God and in response lives in gratitude. And this guy has not had an easy life. His wife has chronic debilitating illnesses. His son has been in prison. But the man is relentless in giving thanks for God's blessing. The practice of gratitude changes a person. I read an article a while back that I saved that said you never really escape who you were in high school. If you are on top of the heap, like you're popular or athletic or good looking, well, the rest of your life you expect life to be like that, and when it doesn't turn out that way, you struggle. Or if you were on the bottom of the heap like I was, the article says you always have to deal with feelings of inferiority. But the practice of gratitude over time overwrites that kind of stuff. And the gospel gets into us 
and we begin to understand ourselves and live as people blessed by God. You see, this isn't just going to change your attitude a little bit. It will change your life for the better. Now, remember, these psalms were sung at Passover, that identity-creating event where God freed the people of Israel from slavery and led them through the Red Sea. In the Exodus, what God was doing was overthrowing the most powerful nation on earth to create hope for a band of slaves who had no hope. So the Psalms aren't teaching us to find some reason to give thanks while still being stuck in slavery, and that's all we're ever going to be. They don't teach us to give thanks since things in the world could always be worse. And they don't teach us to be contented slaves to our addictions, pain, and hurt. What they do, they call us to envision a new way of life because Passover reminds us that God can change the way it is. God has, does, and continues to change the world. And speaking of changing the world, anybody ready for this election to be over? Political signs and banners everywhere, some of them obscene and ugly. Political commercials with ominous music. Emails. Now they got my phone number, and I'm getting text after text after text every day telling me. I get them from both parties warning me that the other candidates are incompetent, stupid, greedy, evil. And all this is amplified and whipped up by some cable news outlets, and Ross Weingartner reminded me during the sermon discussion class, that Facebook has an algorithm where it delivers stuff that is designed to make you angry and aggravated. That's how they make their money. They engage you by amplifying your anger. You see, the world wants you to be angry, wants you to hate. And elections aren't really about the qualifications or platform of a candidate or a party anymore. They're about the awfulness of the other side, so you better vote for me. Then you mix in all the conspiracy theories floating about. It is making people crazy. Not just the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband. In my own neighborhood, I have a neighbor who watches the news and gets so angry, so worked up, he jumps up and starts yelling at the TV, spit flying from his mouth. Friends of ours who were out walking in our neighborhood a few days ago on a pickup truck sped by too fast, and they made a gentle little motion, just slow down, and the guy backs up and curses them out. People are crazy right now. Yeah, there's stuff to be angry about, but Christians don't operate from a place of anger. We operate from a place of trust and gratitude. And this doesn't mean we close our eyes and withdraw from the world. We still see the pain and brokenness and mess. Our hearts still hurt. We're still engaged. But it's like Ann Voskamp said, giving thanks is the way we practice the presence of God. Stay present to his presence. And it's always a practice of the eyes. We don't have to change what we see, only the way we see. In the midst of all this anger and fear, we are able to keep our heads because we're grateful that there is a God at work in this world building his kingdom, that God is on the side of the poor and suffering and downtrodden, that God is a God of justice, and that a new world is coming when Jesus Christ returns. This is why in Philippians, Paul wrote Philippians when he was chained to the wall of a Roman jail cell, that he could write, Whatever you do, in word or deed, give thanks. So I close with a story about a guy named Otha Anders of Ruston, Louisiana, who spent 45 years bending over and picking up something that many of us ignore, pennies. In October 2015, the 73-year-old Mr. Anders, a supervisor for in-school suspended children, took all those pennies to his local bank in 15 five-gallon jugs and deposited a grand total of $5,136.14 into his account. It took the bank's coin machines five hours to count all those pennies. 
But what's truly moving about this story isn't Anders' thriftiness. It's his thankfulness. Every new penny on the ground served as a prompt to give thanks to God, as Anders told reporters. I became convinced that spotting a lost or dropped penny was an additional God-given incentive, reminding me always to be thankful. There have been days when I failed to pray, and more often than not, a lost or dropped penny would show up to remind me. Start looking for those pennies scattered throughout your day and be a person of thankfulness and gratitude. Amen. As Pastor Scott prepares the communion table, let us take some time to offer up our prayers to the Lord. Pray for Judah and Danny and Jeff and Ivan. Justin we offer up all the names on our hearts Lord all the circumstances all the situations knowing that you know them knowing that you love the humans the creation that you've poured your life into and trusting that you will make good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The very first Lord's Supper was a Passover meal. The meal every year when the Israelites looked back and gave thanks to God for God delivering them from captivity in Egypt, for God bringing them into a new and abundant land, for God saving them. Jesus Christ took that Passover meal and made it into a meal of deliverance for us, deliverance from sin, evil, and death, and the opportunity to live a new and abundant life in him. These little pieces of bread and these little sips of juice we get, they seem trivial and insignificant, and how could they really do anything? Mm. But we know that the Holy Spirit brings the presence of Christ, his love, his goodness, his being, his power, into this meal. And in some mysterious way, we take all the blessings of Jesus Christ into ourselves. The word says they shall come from north and south and east and west and sit at table in the kingdom of God. Anyone seeking the Lord Jesus Christ is welcome to this table, for he is the host and we are his guests. Would you pray with me? Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this meal and that you are a God of deliverance. That when we individually and all of us as humankind wandered away from you into the wilderness of sin and got lost and dragged this world down into destruction. You came after us, first through Father Abraham and Mother Sarah, through the people of Israel, through the voices of the prophets, and supremely through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the deliverance that he brings us and pray that we would experience it in every part of our lives, and we pray for those still in bondage that you would free them. God, we thank you for this meal and pray you would send down now your Holy Spirit on these your gifts of bread and fruit of the vine that they would become the very body and blood of Christ for us. In whose strong and saving name we pray. Amen. I hear now the words of the institution of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord took bread, saying, This is my body, 
broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, our Lord took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins of many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. We're going to celebrate the meal by means of intention. We ask you to come forward down here, take a piece of bread and dip it in the juice. If you need to be served at your seat, Eric will come to you. We have gluten-free bread on the little tray here. And would the servers come forward?
Heavenly Father, thank you for feeding us through this meal with all the goodness found in Jesus Christ. Send us out now in the power of your spirit to do your will. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Stand, church. Let's declare as a congregation, as the church, how good God has been, is today, and will forever be in our lives. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never failed me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. He's running after me with my life laid down. I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Thank you, Lord. Your goodness is running after. It's running. After Just 
running after the beauty, the good things that we're doing. He's running after us, knowing our mess, knowing our faults, knowing our mistakes, knowing where we have fallen short because He is a good, good Father. And it might not always seem that He is good. We might be in some really yucky stuff that is hard to believe, that is hard to declare that. But that's where faith comes in. That's where faith enters in. And we have that hope in our good, good Father that He is good and He's going to do good things with our mess, in that mess. He's done it before. He's going to do it again. And I believe that, church. Do you believe that? Yes. That all our life, He's been faithful. That all of us are miracles. That we have a purpose. He's good. He's going to use us for good. Declare that. Declare it. All my life. All my life you have been faithful. Thank you, God. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord. I will sing of the goodness of God. God is good and has a good future for you and for this church. On November 20th, we're going to have a special Sunday of 1 10 a.m. service in the sanctuary, followed by the first potluck supper in I don't know how long. The church is going to provide the meat, I think fried chicken. You're asked to bring a side dish or dessert. And after the meal, we're going to share the vision, the way forward that the session has discerned for Central Presbyterian. It will be exciting. There's a place for everybody. And I hope you'll make a special point of being here. And if this morning you want to give your life to Christ or go deeper into your relationship with Him, or have a prayer need or want to find out more about Central, come see me after the service. And now, my friends, let us live from a place of deep gratitude, the gratitude that has come to us in Jesus Christ and rescued us. The gratitude that comes from the Holy Spirit living within us. The gratitude for knowing God the Father as a loving Father. In all things, let us be grateful in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.